Well, this is some audience. I'd like to warmly welcome all of our participants and luminaries from across the globe. I'm Wendy Singer, Executive Director of Startup Nation Central. On behalf of Startup Nation Central and LNET, we're glad you're joining us for today's discussion about the global economic impact of COVID-19. We hope you'll see this as the opening of a conversation, one that will be continued at a follow-on event where we will focus on tech solutions for global challenges related to COVID as well. That too will be a collaboration between Startup Nation Central and LNET. A few words about who we are. Startup Nation Central is an Israeli NGO that connects innovative Israeli technologies with global challenges. We map Israel's tech sector and share it on a free online user-friendly platform. It's called Startup Nation Finder and the URL is startupnationfinder.org. For example, you all know that Israel is considered by some to be an innovation powerhouse. Well, on the Finder, you will note that there are 1,200 startups and innovative companies in the life science, digital health, and medical devices sector. I'm excited to share that we are well covered today, both on Zoom, Facebook Live on LNET and Startup Nation Central pages, and Bloomberg Terminal Live as well. A word about our agenda. We will soon be joined by Stephanie Flanders, who is the Senior Executive Editor for Economics at Bloomberg and the head of Bloomberg Economics. She will moderate a discussion with three world-leading economists. This will be followed by a VIP Q&A session. I'm now pleased to turn this over to David Siegel, my colleague and friend, who is president of Friends of LNET, the European Leadership Network. David, over to you. Thank you, Wendy. It's great to see you. Uh, on behalf of uh, the European Leadership Network and Startup Nation Central, uh, we thank you all for joining us. LNET is the European Leadership Network, and we're the only organization solely dedicated to strengthening relations between Europe and Israel. Uh, LNET brings together leaders at the highest levels to jointly address global issues, uh, whether they're on collaborating on medicine and scientific innovation or strategic issues in the Middle East and globally, or water and food security, the strength of this relationship between Israel and Europe is vital. Our program today is one example of LNET's and Startup Nation's focus and resources. We invite you to be part of our community and to join our events, as well as our international policy conference that takes place annually in Paris. For more information about our work, please go to www.lnetwork.eu. I'm happy to extend a special welcome to the global leaders joining this truly groundbreaking conference. We have officials from the World Bank and the IMF, from the United Nations, from the European Parliament, and government officials and members of parliament, uh, journalists and business leaders from throughout Europe, the United States, and Asia. To ensure the best sound quality, you'll be muted throughout the program. Uh, Wendy, I'm going to pass it on to you since our first speaker is a bit uh, 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 delayed. Uh, so Wendy, the floor is yours. Now we will move to our panel with three renowned economists, Professor Olivier Blanchard, Professor Jason Furman, and Professor Eugene Candle. It is quite an honor to have with us a moderator with two decades of experience covering economic issues for top tier global media outlets. Please welcome the Senior Executive Editor for Economics at Bloomberg and the Head of Bloomberg Economics Stephanie Flanders. Over to you, Stephanie. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Wendy. It's a, it's a pleasure uh, to be here and to get to uh, lead this uh, 
very distinguished panel of uh, economists that uh, several of whom I've uh, worked with uh, in, in the past in various capacities. As you mentioned, we have Professor Olivier Blanchard, who used to be the chief economist of the International Monetary Fund and is now a senior fellow at the Peterson Institute uh, for International Economics. It's also been recently announced that he will be one of the, uh, will be helping to lead a commission on future economic challenges, which has been created by uh, the French president, Emmanuel Macron. Uh, Jason Furman, Professor Jason Furman, uh, was chairman of President Obama's Council of Economic Advisors and deputy director of the National Economic Council. He's now a joint uh, professor at the Kennedy School of Government in Harvard and the uh, Harvard uh, Economics Department. And uh, Professor Eugene Kandel uh, is the CEO of Startup Nation Central, um, but as many of you will know, was also uh, the Prime Minister of Israel's uh, former chief economic advisor and head of his National Council. We have not a lot of time um, and uh, plenty of things to discuss. I want to get to quickly get to not only where we are now, where the global economy is now, um, but also how we think this next stage of uh, the recession and hopefully recovery uh, will will take place in different parts of the world. We're then going to think a bit more long term about the policy implications of what's happened in the last few months and the structural changes that we might see both in the global economy, things that could particularly affect Israel if we see a change in global supply chains and an attitude change in, towards uh, trade, uh, but also potentially the long-term implications for policy. And there are things that governments have done in the last few months that we would never have expected them to do, certainly not as quickly as they have. Support for wages, direct support for wages, for example, does that set up uh, the case for long-term shifts in policy towards things like uh, universal basic income. I know all three speakers have plenty to add on these topics, but uh, Olivier, Professor Blanchard, I wonder if I could start with you just by posing the obvious question of, you know, where do you think we are now uh, if we think of how the COVID crisis has hit uh, the global economy? But perhaps more important, where do you think we're heading in the next few months? In a sense, it's a harder stage. We had historic declines in economies, historic support for economies. Now we're entering something which is more of a, of, of a, of a gradual situation where more nuanced policy might be called, called for. How do you think we're doing? Good morning, good afternoon. <laughs> um, in short, uh, uh, more optimistic uh, than most. And the main reason is that uh, I think the shock we've had is extremely different from any previous recession or even depression. It was basically policy induced. We did the right thing on uh, health grounds, uh, but it had enormous economic effects. I think that most of what we did can be undone fairly quickly. Not all of it, but much of it. And so my uh, forecast, if you want, is I think the worst is clearly behind us. We, we went to the bottom of the hole and we're climbing slowly, although I think the rate of climbing will be fairly high in the next few months. So quarter three in particular is likely to be quite good. We will recover. At some stage, uh, we will slow down and getting back to trend will be harder. But the initial phase uh, will be a fairly quick recovery, is my guess, with clear political implications for the numbers which come out uh, and the election in the US. Let me stop there. Well, Jason, I know that you have uh, an interest in the potential implications of the election and how that affects uh, the US economy. But short term or medium term, do you agree with uh, Olivier that uh, if not quite a V-shaped recovery, still we could bounce back quite quickly? Um, some are calling it a reverse check mark. I broadly agree with Olivier, but I think I'm going to nudge it in a in a little bit more pessimistic direction. Um, two ways you can grow. One is people can go back to their old jobs. Businesses that were shuttered can reopen. That type of growth can happen very, very quickly. And that's why you'll see fast growth in the third quarter. That's why you'll see tremendous job growth um, and the like. I think though, underlying all of this, there will be parts of the economy that continue to be affected by the virus, whether it's travel or restaurants and the like. 
there also will be a lot of reallocation. Companies that decided they don't need to rehire everyone or a company that was already having troubles before this, say a department store that goes bankrupt as a result of it. So you might get halfway back very quickly, but then you'll still be halfway um, from where you started. In the United States, that would mean you're still, you know, 10 million jobs in the hole, the equivalent of the financial crisis. And that next phase where you need to find jobs at new employers, maybe even worse, you need to find a job in a new industry is a process that's never been very quick. And so I view that more as a slog. Don't expect us to get back to our per capita incomes that we had before the crisis until maybe 2023, a huge amount of uncertainty around that. Um, but I think it could be many years before we you know, even begin to get back to where we were before all of this. Mm. A lot to unpick there, but Eugene Kandel, if you look at the Israel context, uh, do you share this general view of the next few months? Or do you think perhaps there's a bit more structural change that we're going to have to deal with uh, in, the, in the medium term? Well, <clears throat> Israel being uh, an export economy, um, it's uh, basically its recovery depends much less on its local market. Uh, and much more on, on the recovery of uh, United States and Europe, because that's where the main markets for our exports are. And uh, there is some bad news if uh, what Jason says uh, is going to happen in the US. Uh, there are better news. I like uh, Olivier's uh, prospects better. But uh, there is one other thing that uh, there is uh, sort of silver lining to this whole thing is that uh, what would we pretty much know by now is that technology will be in much higher demand in a, after the corona and, and, and during than it was before. And it happens that Israel has a whole bunch of technologies that are quite relevant, has been strong in these technologies traditionally. And so there is some silver lining. So on. we may see um, if, if all these companies uh, survive and become, you know, and, 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 and get ready to, to, to um, launch their sort of competitive offensive, I think there is going to be an interesting, um, uh, interesting uh, how, how this will develop. But overall, it, it all depends on, on the big markets, how they, did, how they recover. And obviously, there is uh, a real question that, uh, in, embedded in really what all of you have said, uh, trying to assess uh, where, how long uh, this, uh, the crisis will last in terms of its direct effect on activity. And uh, Olivia, I wondered, uh, when you think from the European standpoint, you know, one thing that's been very clear, it's been the contrast between the European countries and the US in their attitude to maintaining employment. And by and large, we've seen countries across Europe act to limit the rise in measured unemployment uh, in a way that the US largely hasn't. And we've seen a big difference in the two uh, as a result. If there are some structural changes coming out of this or a prolonged period of social distancing where restaurants, for example, and other people facing businesses really uh, cannot function on the same business models that they had before, does that call in question? Does that make it difficult to sustain that response by governments? Does it start to look like the US response is better? Can I, I want briefly to go back to the first exchange? And I think the central issue is indeed the degree of reallocation that is going to be needed. And it's clear that there are two shocks. And the first one is the ones which are due to physical distancing. And, you know, with some confidence, we can think that by the end of next year, this will be gone. There's no reason to think that restaurants will be dramatically different in 2022 than they were in 2019. Then there are the deeper changes that Eugene was referring to, which is what will happen to travel, what will happen to you know, uh, IT, uh, what will happen to universities. And there are really two views. One is we basically will go back to something quite similar with some changes, but nothing major. And then there's another view, which is, well, the world will be a different place. Um, depending on what you think, then in the first case, you basically want to protect the businesses longer until the physical distancing constraints are gone and then let you know, the economy adjust and when unemployment is lower. Uh, in the second case, you may want to start earlier 
And that answers the question you just asked, which is, I think we have to move to something which was mostly focused on protection of firms, of workers, to something which allows for some reallocation, but in an environment in which unemployment is crazily high, whether it's measured unemployment or non-work, which is very high in Europe, uh, and uh, in which there's enormous uncertainty about the degree of reallocation. So I think we have to go slowly. But indeed, I think the next phase requires us to think about how do we go from these protective schemes to something better. And it seems to me here that the Europe did better in the first, under the lockdown, was more successful in getting money to the right people and to the right firms than the US. And I think it is doing better in thinking about the next step as well. I guess, I mean, Jason Furman, the US response was also very front loaded, but very focused on getting money into bank accounts, but of poor, poor households in particular, but not, or at least it, that was the result. Um, but not on preserving jobs uh, at any at any price. Uh, when you look to the next phase that Olivier is talking about, what are the risks in the US, I guess, particularly around the election? Yeah. So, you know, the US fiscal response was huge. It, it's hard to compare across countries. It appears to be the largest of any country. Um, one success of that, as you noted in the question you're asking, Stephanie, is that in the month of April, households actually saw their disposable personal incomes rise, even though there was massive job loss. And that's because of the transfers they got um, through unemployment insurance and um, through checks. I think it's a real open question as to whether the US system, where an employer can furlough you, and then you get a check from the government, or the European system where you continue to get a check from your employer and your employer gets a check from the government um, as to which of those will be better um, in the long term. I think to a first approximation, they might be more similar than everyone thinks. If Macy's reopens its stores, it's gonna call back the employees that it furloughed. It won't not reopen a store because it can't find the people that worked in that store and have to do a fresh new hiring process. So if you can reopen in the United States, I think you will bring um, your employees back. I think it gives you a little bit of an extra option on flexibility to handle um, the reallocation shock. The tricky thing over the next couple months is that everything I've just talked about that I think has been to some degree successful ends at the end of July. And you know, Congress came together quickly for the first round um, there's much more acrimony, much more polarization right now as people are talking about um, and debating re-upping that round. You know, states and local governments are cutting, which is counterproductive to the overall shape of the recovery. The unemployment insurance I don't think should be extended exactly as it is, but I think if it comes to an end entirely, um, that would mean you know, some downward pressure on the economy going into the fall. And you know, for that reason alone, my guess is Republicans and Democrats will come together to agree on something, not around. Just to push back on your first point, uh, we do have, so Bloomberg Economics combines about 30 independent e economists doing research, but also the hundred odd reporters uh, around the world uh, covering the economy for Bloomberg. And I don't say that only to give a plug, uh, but also to say that, that some of them in the US had actually pulled together some interesting data showing that about it looks like about a third of the unemployment benefits that are due or it have been applied for in the US over the last few months have not been paid yet. If you compare what the, the claims with uh, um, what's actually been going out of the door of the IRS. So I guess that's one point back to you that uh, it's perhaps a less reliable way of getting money to people if you're not using the existing employer. Is that a fair point? Yeah, it varies a lot from state to state. Mm -hmm. These are um, unemployment insurance in the United States is administered by the states. Many states drastically underfunded their systems. Many states deliberately put obstacles in place of workers collecting those benefits. And yes, so it's certainly behind. You know, they'll give you the back benefits once you're in the system. Um, I'm not saying that's ideal at all. So I think in some ways the US system, absolutely, I would agree with you, can be more disruptive for workers. The replacement rates in the US system, the fraction of your wages it pays, 
um, to date have been for two thirds of workers more than 100%. So once you get on the system, you're getting more money for better or for worse than you are in um, the so-called European systems. And Eugene Candel, the, in the, you're obviously been very focused on making sure that there isn't a permanent effect, particularly to the to, to startups, to otherwise viable startups in Israel. And that's a concern of governments everywhere. And it's indeed one of the reasons to have the wage support as well as the other measures is to try and keep viable companies in business. Do you think as we come out of this uh, that we have avoided a sort of wave of bankruptcies, you know, as the support is perhaps removed, as the economy comes back, uh, that, that you haven't, that there won't be that structural hit to otherwise viable companies, or is that still a risk? <clears throat> yeah, the, the issue with startups and the technology companies is a bit different than the rest of the economy, especially the startups, because um, they can actually work. Their, their businesses were not closed because they can all work at home. And so, um, you know, we're talking to a lot of companies, some of them even increased their, um, their headcounts because their, their, their demand uh, went up. But even those that didn't increase their headcount, they do have uh, almost all workers uh, working at home. So th this was less of an issue. The problem with startups is that foreign investments, and in Israel, these are a very high percentage of investments in startups are coming from foreign investors. They basically dried out unless these foreign investors have presence in Israel, they have permanent presence. And so that's the, that's the big issue of uh, basically a liquidity constraint. And so uh, some of the investors are trying to make their companies and their portfolio to either um, close or because they can't support them anymore or, um, or cut costs, which means layoffs. Uh, so the layoffs are driven by the liquidity crisis rather than um, the, the lockdowns. And so that is relatively easy to, uh, to support. And unlike in the previous crisis, Israeli government's been uh, very speedily uh, reacting to that, uh, unlike some other things that are a bit more problematic. But in this case, they were, uh, they were innovative. And uh, um, the difference in Israel is that they didn't go through um, investing directly uh, into funds, but rather um, either doing uh, grants, uh, increasing the, the number of grants that the Israeli Innovation Authority is giving, or going through um, either institutional investors or banks incentivizing them uh, to provide investments and loans uh, together with uh, professional investors in this field. In fact, I think that the interesting thing that, that differentiates between different countries' responses on the medical side and the economic side is to what extent they've been um, scared by the SARS in 2003 on the medical side or the great financial crisis in uh, 2008. And uh, Israel, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, um, was not scared by either one of them. So we came into this fairly um, easily and sort of just gotten, gotten the, the hang of it uh, by, by basically, uh, you know, going through the motions and, and, and then increasing the, the engagement. So this may explain some of the things that happened here. Um, Olivier, uh, if we think about the sort of, uh, we, we've talked a bit, of, we've talked sort of about the, the micro impacts on the economy and the labor market. Uh, when you look at the sort of big picture views of, uh, say, next year and the challenges that we might be facing, I see two sets of viewpoints. One is says that actually we've had all this monetary support and indeed the fiscal support, which will ultimately end in inflation because you have this pent up um, ability spending that has not actually been able to be spent. The other view is that governments will, will mismanage the exit strategy and remove support too quickly and that you will have far more job losses and, and failures next year than you're anticipating now. If you were um, thinking about your IMF World Economic Outlook, which, which risk were you going to focus most on? What are you, what are you concerned about? So I think you have to distinguish between, say, the next 18 months again, I mean, kind of until vaccine and expected value and, and later. 
Uh, I'm not very worried about uh, policy for the next uh, 18 months. I think it will likely to be right, and, and the worries about that will not overwhelm uh, the need to do what is needed on the fiscal side. Uh, in terms of how much will be needed, I think that the big question which, uh, is going to be how much fiscal support on the demand side uh, there, is, there, is, uh, there is going to be a need for. And there are the two forces, I think you, you mentioned one, which is thinking about the next two, the next few months, pent up demand is clearly going to be there. I mean, as Jason said, disposable income went up a lot and consumption didn't. So people are going to want to buy the cars that they didn't want to buy. Uh, at the same time, the big issue on the other side is precautionary saving, which is people at this stage are clearly traumatized and they are saving for precautionary reasons. They don't understand what's happening when I tell them that I think things are going to get better. Many people are absolutely not convinced. They think it could get much worse. So I think there's going to be a lot of precautionary saving, but it might disappear fairly quickly. I mean, if I look at the countries where uh, lockdowns are gone and uh, physical, uh, physical uh, distancing is, is getting uh, is getting weaker. I see a lot more confidence about the future. Things turn around very quickly. So I don't I don't know how much need there'll be for more fiscal help. I am agnostic, but that has an implication, which is that we should be ready, or the government should be ready to do more fiscal help this year, next year, for sure, uh, if it's needed. But maybe it's not, and therefore what you want to put in place is not something which commits yourself to spending a lot, such as green investment, which is something that I would love to see, but it's not the right tool. You need something which is much more nimble. Uh, that's going to be the challenge for the next, uh, say, 18 months. After this, there are going to be issues about the level of debt, about the balance sheets of banks. We can discuss it in response to your question, and we can come back to it. I'll just stop there, and if you want to come back, come back. Uh, I want to come back on, on just on the, on the European angle to you, which is when you talk about fiscal support and the potential for having a capacity there, obviously people will be very interested in the shift in policy you've seen in Europe over the last couple of weeks. First, the proposal from the French and German uh, heads of state and then uh, the follow up from the Commission. You know, some have said that perhaps 2020 will be remembered, at least in Europe, not just for COVID, but also for a pretty historic move in the direction of more burden sharing in in Europe. Do you do you share that view of the potential significance of that of that big support package, particularly the 750 billion? Yes, I, th I think it is significant. As you know, as always, it's a bit less than uh, what some of the opponents have uh, have pushed. But the notion that there is mutually mutualized uh, borrowing and distribution, not according to uh, capital shares or anything like this, but as a function of need, uh, this is major progress. Now, I don't think that this will be ready in time to really fight COVID, uh, and therefore we should think about the best way of using that funds, those funds. But I think it's a really important step, and not one which is going to uh, be completely undone after the crisis. I think the notion that the EU budget can be much larger, that there can be borrowing at the EU level, and that what has to be spent can go to the countries which really need it, as opposed to uh, according to some key. I think all this is there. Uh, I'm relatively optimistic that this will be one of the long-lasting uh, effects of the crisis. But just briefly, on the, I mean, Chancellor Merkel has said she hopes that it will be in place in time to give out some of those grants starting the beginning of next year. You think that's uh, optimistic? I think by then the, the need for these grants will be less clear on, on, on aggregate demand uh, uh, arguments and uh, I'm not sure what the grants are going to be spent for and we're hoping that some of it will go uh, to green investment uh, but um, it's going, there's going to be a lot of give and take about where the money goes and uh, it's going to be messy as always in Europe but on that again something very very positive. Jason, I'd be interested in your, I guess, brief response to, to, to Europe. You know, we've had a long tradition of being disappointed by European leaders, and maybe the last two weeks was a bit different. But also on that point I raised with Olivier about the prospects of either inflation or on the other side of a premature withdrawal. I mean, you've talked a bit about that already for the US, but... Yeah. Um, just as a general matter on inflation, the risks are just very asymmetric. 
Uh, markets are expecting around a 1% inflation rate in the United States and in Europe. If it's three percentage points below what the markets expect, which I think is perfectly possible in the huge deflationary environment we're in, that would be a disaster. A minus 2% inflation rate would be a deflationary spiral. On the other hand, if it's three percentage points above what the markets expect, which I also think is very possible, um, given all the pent up demand that we have, given the large supply shock, then we have a 4% inflation rate. Uh, that's not a disaster. In fact, that might even be ideal because it means lower real interest rates, which help borrowing and um, home ownership, lower real wages, which helps employment and um, deleveraging of debt. So I don't think inflation needs to be on anyone's worry list. I think deflation needs to be on um, people's worries lists. Um, in terms of deficits, you know, I, you, know it, you can tell something about what people expect from Europe by the fact that Italy can right now borrow at, over 10 years at 1.4 percentage points. That's not solely on the basis of expectations about Italy. That's based on bond purchases by the ECB and an expectation of some form of mutual assistance if needed at some point um, in the future. And so, you know, to some degree, you're already seeing markets function as if there was a greater degree of um, European level fiscal policy, European level uh, mutual support than there actually is to date. And the policymakers are to some degree catching up with those market expectations and validating them. And if they don't keep doing that catching up and keep doing that validating, then you could see much higher interest rates in some of the countries that, you know, on their, that left to their own devices um, would have much less fiscal, cons fiscal space. And that would create um, more of a problem for all of this. Um, the final thing I'd say on fiscal policy is just like inflation, where I thought, you know, minus two is perfectly plausible and plus four is perfectly plausible. Um, you know, there's a huge amount of uncertainty right now. And so making fiscal policy, as Olivia said, more nimble, one way to make it nimble is to build in explicit triggers into it. You know, if the unemployment rate is above blank, you know, if it's you know, above in the United States 7%, then you automatically get another round of assistance. If the unemployment rate falls below that threshold, then that assistance is scaled down or that assistance stops. Um, building that in, I think, is especially important in countries that have fiscal system, uh, political systems that are less than fully functional um, and that can't be counted on to do you know, the rational thing at every point in time in the future, figure out the rational thing now, legislate it, and then what happens in fiscal policy will depend on what happens in the economy. Alas, the description of political systems that are not entirely functional covers really quite a lot of countries at this point, but we should probably not list them. Olivia, you, uh, you wanted to, to, to come in briefly. I, I wanted to come on, on inflation. And it seems to me that the probability mass is exactly where Jason put it, which is it's low inflation, probably maybe even the risk of deflation. But I, I tried very hard to think about a scary scenario in which there would be high, there would be high inflation very high inflation, not the three or four percent that Jason had, but something uh, much higher and much more worrisome. And I think it would take a, an unusual combination of things. And first, it would require the desired, desirable rate for macro purposes to increase a lot. So that from a macro point of view, you needed uh, three or four percent real rate, so something like this, which I just don't see happening, but doesn't have zero probability. When this happened, then there would be two things happening. The first one is the central bank would be very reluctant to increase the rates because it would basically lead to a large loss on its balance sheet. And there would be enormous pressure from the government on the central bank to say, look, guys, we need to finance the debt. Please keep the interest rates low. And that's where the issue of fiscal dominance, as we, talk it, as we, as we call it, would come in. Given the way central banks are organized, in particular in Europe at this point, I think the risk of a very large increase in the required rate and fiscal dominance of the central bank is very small. But it's conceivable. But that's the only scenario in which I think this could be ending. This could end very badly. And therefore, I don't put zero probability 
it's a scenario I can think about, but unlikely. And I do want to bring in Eugene in a minute, but just to follow up very briefly on that with Jason, I mean, of course, you talk about investors. One thing that investors seem to have, one of the many things investors seem to have been remarkably relaxed about to date uh, is the likely increase in government debt across the developed world, and particularly Europe and the US as a result of this, uh, including particularly countries like Italy, but really everywhere. Um, do you see... Do you see that changing? Do you think they are right to see that if they are indeed just seeing this as a big step change in debt, but not fundamentally a risk to long-term sustainability? Yeah, the you know, interest rate forecasts for the last 35 years have almost invariably been a forecast that interest rates were about to start rising. And for 35 years, interest rates have consistently fallen my entire professional life has been within all of that. And so, you know, when I see these um, you know, people talking about higher interest rates, but then the market's not expecting those higher interest rates, I'm going to go with the people who have their money on the line rather than the people idly speculating that, you know, this time interest rates are going to skyrocket. Now, I was having, I, I think this is a way that Olivier phrased it in a conversation with me, but I'm but since I have the microphone, I'll say it now, um, which is there's been a lot of discussion and debate about why interest rates were so low even before this crisis. It's gone under the heading of secular stagnation. And most of the candidate explanations for why they were low were things like low productivity growth, low demand for investment, high supply of savings, high inequality. All of those are probably more true today as a result of this crisis than they were a year ago. So the underlying structural forces that have made interest rates so low and fall so much over the last 35 years just seem to still be in place. So I wouldn't bet against the market in their complacency about you know, interest rates not rising. Well, that, that's a brilliant response because you've also managed to steal what might have been Olivier's response. So I will move on to, to Sorry, uh, Olivier. you now. Um, but uh, Eugene, I'm going to give the future to you, the, 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 the longer term uh, structural changes out of this that I know that you're particularly focused on. I mean, we've seen, I guess there's two different kinds of things that have happened and we're going to have to talk about it very briefly, but the, uh, there's potentially uh, technological changes that we knew about being accelerated by this, but also policy shifts coming out of this, which may last. And I'm thinking about <clears throat> more direct support for uh, vulnerable or workers in an economy, or even potentially uh, a universal basic income in some places. How do you see those? Do you think that we, we, have, we are gonna see an acceleration to a new kind of world? Well, it's interesting that you you asking uh, this question uh, because Israel just raised its first ever 100 year uh, bond uh, during the, the pandemic, uh, which was actually at four and a half percent, I think I think it was a pretty good deal. Um, uh, so there is some future, at least that, that the investors see for, for us and for, for the world, because otherwise they wouldn't be doing that. I think that uh, you can you can split this um, issue into two uh, two areas. One is the medium term, how we get um, ready for these uh, pandemics in general. And Olivia mentioned the precautionary savings that people people are are, are making uh, today just out of um, fear. I think that should be uh, one part of uh, prudent uh, policy for governments to actually, instead of doing all these um, demand enhancing um, measures uh, when things are tough, uh, creating some kind of precautionary savings that are mandatory uh, uh, would, be, would be a reasonably good idea and then just opening them up when the macro event happens. As far as your longer term question, I think that uh, it's clear that as most uh, crises, um, this crisis also accelerated uh, the tech transformation. And unlike the 30, 40 and before years ago, when uh, we were basically replacing uh, uh, muscles uh, with machines, um, the, current, uh, uh, the current technological change for over 
perhaps 20 years or even more, uh, is replacing basically senses and, uh, and brains with, with uh, software. And software, as we all know, has this tendency to have incredibly high economies of scale, unlike the machines in the past. And so we, it's not inconceivable that the lower demand for labor that we're experiencing now can be translated into lower need for labor uh, when uh, what Olivia was talking about, if companies really um, change the way they work and uh, create much leaner organizations, much more remotely connected organizations that would require a whole bunch of uh, professions to, to either disappear or shrink. So if we have lower demand for labor, we can actually reach a point where we may have labor redundancy. So we may have excess labor as not as a bug, but as a feature of our economy. Um, and if that happens, we're definitely going to have uh, significant social unrest. We, we see that already, uh, which will be translated to political and outside of pol politics. It will bring radicalism into politics and into our um, public discourse. And so it's, it's some way we're going to have to deal with this. And that's where what you suggested, citizen wages, um, are going to come to, to play because uh, at some point you can't really, you may, can't, you may be able to tolerate a small number of homeless on the streets, but you cannot tolerate five or 10% of the population being homeless. So that's, uh, that's going to create need for citizens wage. And then we are basically in a conundrum because a citizen's wage uh, requires uh, higher taxation. High taxation means that you have to tax people who are increasingly movable because of technology. And the most uh, highly paid people are technologists and people who are entrepreneurs. And as we've seen, uh, these people are highly movable across countries. Uh, and so if you create uh, very um, high or, or, or generous uh, citizen wage, you have to raise taxes, people may leave, you may end up without, without an ability to actually provide that. And so that brings me to the need for tax harmonization, which even in the European Union, which is the most harmonized area that, that we can see today across countries, you do not see tax harmonization um, as, as a as an outcome, maybe it'll change. But this this circle that 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 is created is really worrying. And do you think there's a possibility? Uh, again, thinking a bit more about the sort of radical economic options uh, that might open up. Uh, Olivier mentioned green investments. Do you think there is scope for tilting uh, support for the economy in COVID towards? investments in sustainable investments in the future either when it comes to green issues or some of the changes that you're you're talking about eugene making making the transformation of the economy less painful for people just to come back to you eugene first yeah the, this is this is very interesting and it's it's actually broader than green because it's it's anything that's impact and there is a whole movement uh, about sort of enhancing impact investments the only problem is that um, in order to, uh, to do really high, uh, unless you just want to spend money, but if you want to do it uh, in order to change the country or change the economy, you really need to have a flow, a deal flow of, um, of good and scalable projects. And there is, a, there is an interesting paradox in, in our world if you look at the people who are uh, large investors, let's say pension funds and uh, family offices, et cetera, there's an estimation by IFC that there is about $26 trillion that are ready to be impact, you know, invested in impact investments. At least that's, that's what they declare. If you look at where would, but they always say, well, we don't really have much deal flow to invest. And if you look where these deal flow starts, it starts with tiny, tiny, uh, organizations that are financed by philanthropy or by these supported by by various foundations and so there's a huge mismatch between these enormous amounts of money that are allegedly available for impact investments and they're basically no money that of that even not the one one tenth of a percent that goes to actually generate the deal flow that will be 
uh, available for them to invest in. So I think that there is a whole a need for, for creating a flow just like we see in the venture capital, to create a flow in impact venture capital that would have the, the startups, uh, VC funds, angels, uh, uh, growth funds, private equity, and then these giant, uh, giant investors, they can invest in large projects. And this has been lacking. We're trying to see how technology can be fit into this, into this equation. Olivia, how ready do you think are European governments? I mean, you talked about the commission and the potential timing issues there, but European governments themselves, uh, one hit early on the crisis, we heard a lot of talk about how this will be an opportunity, you know, as businesses are supported, we can put uh, strings on this money and say, well, you can only do environmentally good things or you can, you have to accelerate your move to carbon neutrality in order to get this money. And then the, in, the, in practice, the need to get money out of the door is sort of in conflict with that desire to have lots of elaborate uh, conditionality and make it do lots of wonderful things in the future. How have European governments been able to tilt some of this lending in directions that are good for the future as well? I think there's a limit to what governments can do without uh, the correct pricing of, of carbon. Uh, and uh, I think the, the only solution is to have uh, carbon pricing play a major role in leading private actors to do the right thing. Um, everything else is short of the mark. Now, whether this happens, unfortunately, as we know, this tends to have adverse distributional effects. And so, so long as we can't solve that, uh, it's not going to happen on the scale we need. I think one of the, of the major challenges post-crisis is indeed to get to something like carbon pricing, plus a number of projects, but taking into account and repairing the distributional implications. Maybe it happens, uh, again, we're between hope and forecast here. Uh, my hope is that it happens and there'll be a bit more of a window to do it. The other thing which I think will happen was happen, and the pressure was there before the crisis, but I think it's going to be more intense given the need to refine tax revenues and the inequality again, is that we're going to see heavier corporate taxation. So I think that some of the agreements, the potential agreements on the uh, taxation of multinational firms and so on are more likely to take place after this COVID crisis than they were before. Uh, that would be good. Uh, but something like this, you know, even corporate taxation at the national level, I think is likely to be higher. Well, it's interesting that you say, Olivia, anything that depends on uh, multinational agreement and governments coming together at the moment, uh, people have been, it looks less likely in, in most other contexts, but maybe that's one area where uh, it, it might happen. I mean, Jason, just to go on to that, uh, Obviously, Israel and Europe greatly affected by what the global trading system looks like. Uh, there's been a great ratcheting up of rhetoric and indeed genuine source of geopolitical tension that isn't only due to Rob President Trump uh, coming in the relationship between the US and China. You know, does that have you changed your view of what independent of who wins the election in the US? Have you changed your view of what the global economy looks like? over the next few years as a result of what we've seen in the last year or so? Yeah, I mean, globalization is often treated by commentators like a very fragile plant because, and you've seen it in the course of your career, Stephanie, every few years people are proclaiming, this is gonna kill globalization, that is gonna end globalization, this is the end of globalization. Um, and yet somehow it continues to march on. No, I'm certainly not thrilled with you know where we are um, right now. I, the best I could say is at least the United States hasn't yet withdrawn from the World Trade Organization, um, in addition to its withdrawal from the World Health Organization. I think that you know there's all sorts of legitimate issues with China, but there's a ton of illegitimate issues that are brought up with China and a lot of illegitimate ways those issues are raised and dealt with. So I personally would believe in dealing on a multilateral basis um, with any challenges with China, dealing through the World Trade Organization. But you know, just look in the last few weeks, there have been a couple major American companies that have increased their investment in China and have located new investment in China. So there is a set of noise 
a set of uncertainty on one side, and then there's a set of very, very powerful forces that the United States is you know, 5% of the global population, 20% of global GDP. Those companies are gonna to wanna to operate um, around the world. They're gonna to wanna to sell around the world. They're gonna to wanna to locate around the world. Wages can often be lower, production, um, you know, integrated you know, global supply chains have challenges, but they have enormous, enormous benefits. That's why we have so many of those global supply chains. So you know, I think we're seeing some damage to globalization. I think we're seeing some slowdown of it. I'd like to see it handled very differently. But, you know, whatever the governments do, I think the economic forces are powerful enough that we will continue to have a high level of globalization, if not a rising level of globalization for some time to come. I mean, I would say what you said about supply chains definitely fits with what uh, some of my people are seeing on the ground in Asia that we have. There's a lot of talk about people unwinding their supply chains and distancing themselves from China or at least diversifying. But on the ground, there has been so much commitment, as you suggested, by these major US companies that, uh, and they're looking at the possibilities for diversification in say Vietnam and saying, well, you could put your factory in Vietnam, but then half of the inputs are still coming from China. So you're not necessarily gaining anything. So I think that's, that's definitely uh, true. But Eugene, I mean, it does seem, I'm interested to know what you think about the potential change in the global trading environment, because even if the economic forces favoring, into, uh, favoring global supply chains are still there, if you move to a more bilateral uh, situation on trade negotiations and trade relations, that's inevitably less good for small countries. So how, do, how does Israel fit in that? Yeah, definitely uh, challenging for small countries when two 800-pound gorillas are uh, arm wrestling. You know, this is you try to get at least not get under their both fists. Uh, so, uh, but I am a bit uh, less. Uh, uh, I, I, I agree that globalization will remain high for a variety of reasons, uh, but I think it will. Um, one important thing that we we have to remember that. I don't think that today um, U.S. administration or another U.S. administration can really look uh, at the situation which is completely dependent on a variety of critical um, issues on other countries, China or not China, it doesn't really matter. And the, what this pandemic showed, and this was a relatively light case uh, of pandemic. I mean, in terms of sort of closures, uh, we are we're seeing we're coming out of it in in a few months, hopefully. Um, there are much worse things that can happen, uh, and so when another national government can just lock the border, or you locking the border because you cannot let anybody in because they just uh, you know potentially can can infect you. Uh, it, it, it creates huge dependencies on, um, in the areas of uh, pharma pharmaceuticals, food, the electronics, uh, critical, uh, critical machinery, et cetera, et cetera. And so that, that in, in my opinion, will lead to um, unwinding and making the supply chains still international, but much more local in terms of geographies. There will be, in my opinion, there will be much more trade much closer to regionally uh, and less uh, trade uh, across the world in uh, uh, and because it, it by accidentally it will also be good for for the green that we were talking about before because there will be much much less transportation but it's still uh, and I think that uh, the fact that we don't see that is because these things take a very long time you know, to plan uh, a transfer, especially transfer from significant uh, plant from one location to another, especially when your labor costs go up by four or five times, um, is a tricky situation. You want to employ uh, or deploy all the available technology that you can. And so in, in our opinion, there's going to be a drastically increased demand for the industry 4.0 uh, companies and technologies that will help position. I also think that there will be benefits for, for example, for uh, South America um, in terms of supplier to Europe, for Eastern Europe, for supply to Western Europe, 
I think there will be much more of that, but it cannot, we cannot expect that it will happen under COVID within two months. I mean, that'll, that'll take a um, few years. I think it's going to be, in our opinion, it's going to be uh, the, major, the major shift in terms of in capital investments in the next, or the, most, the major driver of the capital investments in the next five years. We should say that um, we are grateful to the, the French Minister Bruno Le Maire for giving us a little bit of extra time with his, uh, with his delay in, in, in reaching us, but it, it has given us a little bit more time to talk. Olivia, I wanted to just uh, give you a chance to speak to this uh, potential change in the global uh, supply chains, but also particularly countries, individual countries' attitude to globalization, because I was struck I think it was a G20 meeting in Riyadh, uh, which was one of the first ones to think about COVID in sort of late February. And Bruno Le Maire at that meeting was one who specifically immediately raised the issue of potentially bringing production of key goods back home as a result of this crisis. And at that point, we were just thinking of it as a shock, or he was perhaps just thinking of it as a shock from China rather than this kind of global shock. But he said it was not a question of protectionism, it was a question of national, uh, of, of economic sovereignty. Uh, do you think in Europe you might see a bit more of uh, this effort to turn inward uh, in some areas? Yeah, I mean, I think that COVID is reinforcing something, the forces which were there before COVID and will be there after COVID. Uh, there is clearly a backlash against uh, the distributional effects of globalization. And it would make clearly there that puts pressure on countries to try to keep things at home. Um, there is the security issues which have come before COVID. There is now the geopolitical issues which make firms reluctant to go to a country which might get into a, a or of some sort with the US and so on. So I think we're going to see, I'm very much where Jason is. I don't think it's going to be a, a, a sea change, but uh, we're going to see reorganization, shortening of supply chains, as uh, Eugene mentioned, uh, repatriation at home. You know, firms always have to basically deal with both profit and whether the government is on their side. As long as the governments were at least officially open to trade, integration and so on this you know you could concentrate on profit and globalize and organize now you basically know that the governments are going to put pressure on you to stay home uh, they're not on your side so i think we're going to see some of that again i don't think it's going to be dramatic because the benefits from globalization from trade are gigantic people are not willing to pay three times what they were paying before for some things. Um, but yeah, I think that that's going to lead to a slowdown, maybe a temporary stop in uh, globalization. And as Jason said, you can find that the supply chains are so complicated that it's almost impossible to unwind because when you think you've nationalized one product, you realize when there's retaliation from the other country that actually you need the inputs for that product from that country. So it's, it is, it's too much, probably too intricately wound. Um, we have some, I know Wendy Singer uh, has been field, has fielded some, some excellent uh, expert to get to now uh, before we hear from the French minister. So it's, uh, I shall hand over uh, to Wendy Singer now, but in the meantime, thank you very much to all the speakers. Thank you, Stephanie, and thank you to our panelists. That was some discussion, certainly wide ranging and gives us a lot to think about. Uh, before we move to the Q&A, I would like to note uh, that we are about to um, give you an opportunity to fill out a live poll. As I mentioned earlier, Startup Nation Central and LNET will be co-hosting an online conference that will focus on practical tech solutions to your COVID related challenges. But we also want that conference to be customized to your needs. So right now you will see a live poll that's showing up in your pop-up window uh, on your screen. And we're gonna ask you to take a minute and select from the sector challenges, those that are most relevant for your country or your company. This will take less than one minute of your time. 
We very much appreciate your input. Now we are, uh, I, I should note, uh, as we're about to uh, open up the uh, VIP Q&A session, that I'm told we've been joined by dozens of journalists from uh, 20 countries and four continents uh, who will be with us as part of this, uh, as part of this session. I have a, a couple of requests for those asking questions and for those answering them. Uh, we would like to ask that you give very brief questions and that the panelists' answers be brief as well. And for those asking questions, could you please direct your question to a specific panelist? Um, so I see the first one here is from um, Stephen Erlanger, who is the chief diplomatic correspondent uh, in Europe for the New York Times. Steve, oh, great to oh, see you again. Nice to see you as well, and Olivier also. So I have two questions, one for Olivier, um, which is, do you believe uh, the German line that it's a one-off deal yeah, for that. this recovery fund, um, or do the French regard it as having broken the seal of something for the future? And I have a question to Mr. Kandel. Will partial annexation of, of the West Bank be good for Israel's economy or bad for Israel's economy? Thank you both. Good. So I'm muted. Uh, I think it is thought of as a one-off deal, but the history of the world suggests that once something is put in place, it doesn't quite go away and leads people to think differently. So I suspect that uh, some of what was done there will remain. And again, the role of the EU budget will surely be larger and the notion that uh, the EU can go will remain. Is this is not a political uh, discussion, but economic one. Um, you think that uh, the direct effect of any political um, settlement or, or one-sided uh, uh, act by any side will have relatively little um, effect on Israeli economy because uh, there is a study by Rand Corporation that showed that even full peace be between the Palestinians and Israelis will lead to about, you know, ten dozens, many dozens of percentage points increase for Palestinian economy, but only less than 5% of increase for the Israeli economy because of differences in the economy. So the direct effect of this uh, or any other act will be relatively minor. The indirect uh, effect that can come through political channels, uh, international political channels, I have no idea. I'm not an expert on, on that. Of course, you can imagine any, any degree of, um, of, uh, of response. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. And um, I'm actually now going to um, share a question that uh, was submitted by Sever Plotzker, who is the economics editor at uh, Yediot. And um, Mr. Plotzker's question is directed toward Professor Blanchard. Um, and it's a, actually a three-part question. Uh, after the first wave of the pandemic is over, what are the different prospects for recovery of economies with different industrial structures? That's part one. Will an economy with a strong IT sector like Israel's grow more quickly as opposed to an economy with a large public sector? That was number two. And the final uh, of this three-part question, can one make different projections based on the different paths of assistance to the new unemployed and to the business sector in various countries. Professor Blanchard, those are for you. I think I think the three three questions are about the, the, the same thing in general. My sense is for the next uh, eighteen months, what's going to happen will be determined much more by the dynamics of the infection uh, and the coming back of the second wave or not, and through. Uh, demand, aggregate demand uh, of, of a traditional kind. Uh, 
are looking forward and starting, you know, earlier but becoming much more important is going to be the effect of the relocation. And I think it's safe to say that countries which rely very much on IT as a substantial sector of the economy are probably going to do better uh, than some of the others. And therefore, I think that from that point of view, uh, the medium run for Israel is clearly more favorable than for nearly any other country from the point of view of IT. Okay, thank you very much. Um, the third, um, the third question is Matthew Peloli, who is the senior economics reporter from the Parisienne, which is the largest and most popular French daily. Matthew. Yes, hello, thank you. Uh, my question is for Jason Furman. Uh, the economic crisis linked to the coronavirus is taking a dramatic turn in the US. Is the country at a turning point in its history about to be outdistanced by China from an economic point of view? And is the current crisis really dramatic or will the American economy recover as it did after 2008? Uh, thank you for that, um, that question. You know, if you'll, you look purely in terms of GDP, the United States had a smaller contraction in the first quarter than Europe or China. It appears set to have a smaller contraction in the second quarter, in fact, considerably smaller contraction than Europe um, is going to have. I think the medium term consequences mean that China, Europe, and the United States will all be below their trend level of output you know, five years from now that they would have been on because of this. The US fiscal and monetary response has been quite good. The biggest problem for the US economy has been the health response. Um, first of all, a, a, just a tragedy in terms of the number of people who have died. But by doing less of a lockdown, we had less of a contraction in GDP than other places, but also are emerging from that lockdown period with more cases than many other places, which will make it harder for us in um, the coming period of time. The big open question is the one we were discussing to some degree at the beginning, which is what happens with employment. If the United States has an unemployment rate of 10% two or three years from now, you know, for us, that's a disastrously high level of unemployment because it's layered on top of a country where fewer people participate in the workforce than participate in the workforce in France and uh, most other European countries. On the other hand, if employment can recover more quickly, um, that will matter a lot. Another question is whether this becomes an opportunity to address some of the structural problems in the US economy. For example, the high levels of inequality, minimum wage was last raised 13 years ago. Do people look at all the frontline workers who they're lionizing as heroes right now and come back and say, you know what, a lot of them are making at or near the minimum wage. We need to raise the minimum wage. We need to do something to build a more inclusive and sustainable economy. That's the lesson I would love to see coming out of this, I'm not sure whether or not that's the lesson that actually will come out of this. All right, thank you, Jason. Um, next, I'd like to, uh, so we have a question here from Chris Porter, who is the uh, Managing Director and Regional Executive at BNY Mellon. Uh, I understand Chris will be joining us on audio. Yeah, that's right, thank, thank you, Wendy. And I guess it's just a, a question that is a uh, maybe a variation on the discussion that just took place on globalization. I thought those were excellent points from all the panelists, and I definitely appreciated Eugene's comments about the, the need to ensure the integrity, integrity and the resilience of supply chains in the future. Maybe a question for Professor Furman. Um, so the globalization seems to be drawn somewhat into question. I, I appreciate your optimism uh, around the globalization tendencies and the inertia around it, but it seems to be drawn a little bit into question in terms of the future form of it with the uh, coronavirus pandemic. And certainly from a financial industry perspective, you know, the, the trend that we've been experiencing is something that we've taken very much for granted, almost considered 
future proof as a paradigm or a foregone conclusion that it would continue, at least on an economic front. But recently, Professor Joseph Stiglitz even contended in his uh, piece that related to the challenges, the economic challenges around the pandemic um, and what the world would look, look like afterward, that we've actually constructed a system that's highly vulnerable to disruptions and insufficiently diversified, also going back to supply chains, and that our future state will need to strike a better balance between, on the one hand, taking advantage of the benefits of globalization, but on the other hand, an increased ability to be self-reliant. So if with a policy perspective, I'm just wondering if you would have any views on initiatives or concrete policy measures that you would like to see in coming years to ensure that the global economy re remains sustainable and globalization continues to play an important role. So. Yeah, so I'm not positive what I think even about is right about the diversification. For you know, the United States, one of the biggest supply chain problems we've had has been with our food supply and especially our meat supply. That's entirely domestic. That's not a global issue. And you know, there have been disruptions domestically, disruptions you know, internationally. If you're a smaller country than the United States, you, know, you should be much more concerned that a shock hits your country and disrupts it. Um, and you're better off if you're more part of the global system and globally diversified than, than everything in your country. So I think diversification goes both ways. And it's not obvious to me that moving everything inside your country is the right way to diversify. Um, it does diversify against a certain set of political risks of you know, the US-China trade war type. But to uh, other types of events, I could argue um, that a certain amount of the international diversification would be good. Um, what would build more robustness? Well, you know, just one example, the global lender of last resort is the IMF. They said they've expected to get $2.5 trillion of applications. So far, they've um, gotten well below that, but they only have a trillion dollars of resources that they're able to commit. So you know, while the United States and Italy, we were talking about before, can borrow quite cheaply right now, and Germany can borrow at negative nominal rates, a lot of emerging markets have had a tougher time borrowing. Um, and the Federal Reserve is buying you know, all sorts of corporate debt. It's not buying, um, and it shouldn't buy, it's not the Fed's job. Uh, it isn't buying emerging market debt. So building up some of those instant international institutions, the IMF is just one example but at the current moment is, I think, a very good example of you know, a way in some sense that you do global diversification right. Every country puts some money in and um, you know, commits resources if needed. And when they're needed, whoever needs them gets those resources. So I guess I'd like to see more international diversification and the more it's done on a multilateral basis, the better. Thank you, Jason. And thanks, uh, thanks to you, Chris. Uh, now I'm going to take a question from uh, Ar Armel Bohinust, the senior reporter on international economy for Le Figaro. Uh, Armel, please, please join us. Hi. Central banks and governments are distributing a lot of money to states, companies, citizens. To what extent can they go? Is there a limit to that? And what will be the impact of these measures on the country's economies and on people's life in the next years? And who would you like to direct your question to? Is that Professor Blanchard? Yes. That, uh, Who would you like to direct your question to? To Professor Blanchard, please. Okay. okay. So I, I think at the state, indeed, we're seeing uh, extreme measures both on the fiscal front and the monetary front. And on the fiscal front, basically giving money to the firms and the people who need it and maintaining aggregate demand equal to whatever the economy can, can produce. Uh, that's exactly what they should be doing. It's expensive. It increases that. But as we discussed earlier, 
uh, we can probably afford much higher levels of debt before worrying. And the central banks are keeping interest rates low in order, again, to push uh, the economy out. And they are doing the right thing. And it turns out at this point that uh, they have to go as far as they can, which is a uh, zero rate at the short end and lower rates uh, on a, a year curve for both private and public uh, um, um, bonds. I think that's exactly what they should be doing. Can they do it for a long time? They cannot do it forever, but again, we, they will not need to do it forever. Um, and I, we discussed earlier what the issues might be in the medium run, which is if that is really too high, the interest rate increases a whole lot, then there'll be problems, but we think it's unlikely. And for the central banks at this stage, uh, again, it's not an issue. It's really become an issue under the same conditions, which is if interest rates increase a whole lot, uh, then they'll have to take a decision as to how what they do. Uh, they can do the right thing. So, yes, I mean, these are scary numbers from just uh, a numerical aspect, but I think the risk is very small, and uh, we may have to revisit these things in the future, but for the moment, I don't worry too much. Thank you very much. Um, we actually have a question from uh, John Armstrong from the U.S. Embassy in Poland. All right, it's actually a three-part question. How long will the recovery take? Uh, number two, how can businesses that require crowds, hospitality, entertainment, food, adjust to the new normal? And three, can the three C's initiative serve as a driver to bring Europe back economically from the effects of COVID? So would any of our uh, panelists like to take on that question from John Armstrong? How long will recovery take? I think, if you want to mute me, I think we have discussed it at the beginning and it seems to me that uh, you know, Jason and I were uh, uh, on the same wavelength in terms of uh, direction, but not quite in terms of the speed. Uh, the recovery, I think, will, as we both agreed, will be fairly fast at the beginning because it's just a question of reopening things which are firms which were closed. And then eventually uh, it will slow down because there'll be some new structural problems that have to be solved. And uh, we're not, so I think it will go fairly quickly up and then. Uh, much uh, more slowly back to the old trend or to some to some trend. Uh, I would think again that the rest of the year will be fairly good in terms of numbers, and the next year will be less impressive. Um, on the physical distancing, my sense is that this is very much a temporary shock, that it will at some stage not be needed, and when it's not needed, all the businesses which are suffering from the constraints from physical distancing will be able to go back to where they were before. Uh, as we discussed earlier, there are other sectors which will be much more affected even after that. But at least a large part of the economy is going to have this shock, this physical distancing uh, induced shock, which will disappear uh, partly over time because we'll find better ways of producing under these constraints and partly because when there is a vaccine, there will be no need for it. Uh, mm. I don't know if Jason wants to add anything. Yeah, I mean, I, I distinguish between the, the first round effects, which are the direct effect of a virus on a business, which, you know, last month meant your business couldn't be open. Now it means you can seat people outside if you're a restaurant and you can't seat people inside. Three months from now, you can seat people at half capacity a year from now, you know, at full capacity or whatever it is. Um, that's the direct effect of the virus. There's then an indirect effect of just the economic problems associated with the virus. You know, in the financial crisis, fewer people went to restaurants. Restaurants laid off workers. Restaurants changed as a result of it. That had nothing to do with it being unsafe to be in a restaurant in the year 2008 or 2009. And it was because people lost jobs and lost incomes. And when that happens, it propagates throughout the economy in terms of insufficient demand, lack of jobs and the like. You know, I am worried about that second, second round effect persisting past the first round effect. 
So, you know, even when the direct effect of the virus is gone, um, that you have that second round effect. Now, if we do everything, continue to do everything well in terms of fiscal and monetary policy, maybe we'll contain that second round and it will be relatively fast. But I'm worried, one, that we won't do everything well in terms of policy, and two, that the reallocation we were talking about before means it would be um, persistent. So I would distinguish between, yeah, what the virus will cause, which I think we'll get over relatively quickly, and the underlying economic momentum, which could be more persistent and outlast the virus itself. Eugene, did you want to add anything to that? You need to unmute. Yeah, I just want to, to put a little bit of um, down, because uh, it seems to me that we, we sort of dismiss the, the livelihood of this uh, virus as being very, very uh, limited and, and short. And I think that uh, there are definitely um, possibility for a second round, which will make it, uh, you know, which will make it more, more, more problematic. But even more, more problematic is that it's not going to be U or V shaped recovery, but it will be WWW shaped recovery that we will be going. And we've seen that in some countries which opened up. And unless they are able to completely control their, their, their citizens or the citizens themselves are very, very disciplined, you can see suddenly a spike. So I'm, I wouldn't take lightly the poss these possibilities. If I was a government, I would definitely worry about those and then have all kinds of contingency plans for, uh, for, for, such, uh, for such scenarios. I think Olivia wants to say something. So I, I think Eugene is raising a serious issue, which is what happens if the infection rate increases. And I think there's a good chance that it does in some countries. Uh, today, there were numbers about Iran, which were very, very striking in uh, showing a very strong second wave. Uh, I think then the issue is the very hard issue to uh, qu question to answer is what will governments do? And I think there, there is a, a profound aversion to more lockdowns. And uh, then the question is what happens if we don't do lockdowns in response to the second wave or the third wave, then we may have uh, the infection rate continuing at a fairly high rate for a long time. Uh, and again, at the end of it is only the vaccine, but you know, this herd immunity uh, idea or, or strategy that was there at the beginning and, and was rejected may actually in the end in some countries be, in some countries be the way the uh, the epidemic uh, um, goes on. I'm very worried about this combination of an increase in the infection rate and the lack of political will to do what is needed to slow it down. I think that's one of the major issues thinking forward, uh, the way things could go wrong. Okay. Of course, you spoke recently about the need to radically uh, ramp up the uh, testing per day in the US, which I think is, plays into this, uh, this conversation. Um, next question, I'm calling upon Jade Grandin from L'Opinion. Yes, hi, this is Jade Grandin. Uh, my question for Olivier Blanchard and Jason Furman is whether uh, we sacrificed the fate of younger generation with this crisis in terms of employment, education, and debt. So yeah. I'll start, then Jason can add something. It seems to me that it's going to be very tough to uh, be a, a student this year, to graduate this year in the labor market, which is, which is very tough. Um, again, I think this is like, we saw it at the, uh, during the financial crisis. It's not a good time uh, to graduate and, and go into the labor market when unemployment is extremely high. It will go away. I don't think that's a long run phenomenon, but some, some young people are going to suffer from what's happening. Jason. Yeah. And I, I agree with that um, completely. You know, in terms of debt, I wouldn't think about it entirely in those terms. You know, at, a lot of what we're seeing right now is federal governments are borrowing, but they're borrowing on behalf of others, businesses, people, and, um, states and localities. 
And, you know, moreover, insofar as that borrowing is used effectively, it's going to help strengthen the economy and put the economy in a better position for people to have stronger wages and be in a position to repay that debt. So I agreed with everything on your list. I would not think of debt in intergenerational terms right now if the debt is incurred for purposes that are economically effective. And by the way, real interest rates are negative, so you're repaying with money that's less valuable than what you borrowed. If you're using that money economically effectively, I wouldn't worry about the debt being a burden. Um, I would worry, though, um, about the economic situation. Thanks, Jason. That was an important message for the next generation. Um, we have time for one more brief question, um, and that is from uh, Jose Oldak from the U.S. Would you like hey, to join thanks. us? Um, sure. Thank you so much for, for taking my question. And um, I think overall, the outlook seems to be pretty positive uh, from what I've been hearing. However, I think that we're stressing um, certain sectors, certain parts of uh, the economies and of the social systems that uphold these economies. And um, the one thing that we are not really seeing is that complex systems are by definition complex. Therefore, I think that there is some underlying black swans that we have not really started considering or at least have not been addressed uh, today that uh, are lurking there, are being stressed and are just waiting to wreak havoc on um, the future months, future years. Uh, what's the crisis that's boiling underneath that nobody is, is really paying attention to? So I don't know if maybe um, Eugene would like to take that question or if any of the other speakers would like to take that question. It was too hard for me, so Eugene, definitely. <laughs> Lost the audio. I don't know if everybody else lost the audio. Yeah, no, no, it's uh, somebody just forgot to unmute me. So, um, yeah, this is, uh, of course, by definition, um, you know, always, uh, like they said, nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition. I mean, you never expect the unexpected. So it's a very hard question to answer. But I'm going to go back to what I'm, uh, what I was uh, mentioning earlier is that what worries me uh, for the last few years is um, that the degree of the development of technology and the degree to which it replaces the labor, I'm uh, sort of coming back to 1930 Keynes' worry of technological unemployment. Uh, he was definitely way ahead of his time with, his, with this worry and it never materialized over the next 90 years. But it, it doesn't mean that it cannot materialize. And so if we get there, we're not equipped to deal with the social lack of social cohesion and social unrest and radicalism that will grow out of this. And we're not equipped with, um, with our tax systems uh, to actually, uh, we're having tax competition and that allows a lot of people and a lot of companies. And here, I think, uh, Olivia, you, you did mention that corporates are going to be better taxed, but there will be always uh, countries that will bring these corporates to them and the United States can sort of force them back, but uh, many other countries cannot. And so what, uh, what you can do in the US or maybe even in Europe, you may not be able to do in other countries. So this is a big problem. How do you really choose whether to be a more unequal country and higher growth or being very equal country with very, very low, low growth because you're gonna be staying with uh, much less productive uh, workforce than otherwise. So I think that is a big, big issue and it's going to introduce very large uh, inequality um, across countries, which has been declining over time, but it, it may it may actually go up uh, again. Um, so that, that's my sort of black swan that, that, you know, I'm worried about. All right, thank you. Um, thank you, Eugene. Uh, we have um, a question here that we received on chat. Um, what can Europe and Israel do to assist Africa and other developing countries out of the crisis? 
Uh, just before uh, one of you uh, takes that question, I just want to note that we will be joined by um, Minister Lemaire in about four minutes. So uh, we encourage everyone to, to who's with us on the line to stay with us. Uh, now, uh, which one of you would like to take that question? I can start. Um, I mean, it is obvious that Africa, African countries are going to need help. And that's where the IMF and the World Bank uh, can do uh, a lot of good. I suspect that in many cases, uh, that that burden, both the one they had before the crisis and the one that they are going to accumulate as a result, is going to be too high. And there'll have to be a lot of debt restructuring. Again, I think the IMF is in a good position to help the parties get to uh, agreement. Uh, they are going to need help. But the good news is that Africa is poor, so the, the problems they have at the world scale are tractable if uh, rich countries are willing to put their money. It's not a gigantic amount of money, but it's absolutely needed. Okay. Jason or Eugene, do you want to take that one? I just am very worried about um, the rich countries being so preoccupied with their own problems right now that they're turned inward. And, you know, while these aren't incredibly expensive things to do, the, you know, expanding the IMF's capacity I was talking about, what Olivier was talking about, you know, I think is still, you know, a big lift to happen, uh, you know, for the United States right now. And, you know, I think that's foolish. I think the money would do enormous amounts of good. I think some of it would be protective of us ultimately, but you know, I don't see any country doing a, a particularly great job stepping up and, and looking out right now. Certainly not um, the world's biggest countries. Right, certainly yeah. not foreign aid is not a popular topic in the US as well. Uh, I think, uh, may, may, I, may I say a couple of things? We've been, we've been actually looking into this um, and one of the biggest issues uh, well, actually, two two big issues. One is that the technology that is always uh, the solution for increased productivity, which has to has to bring people out of poverty, um, is very hard to deploy <clears throat> in these countries. And so, <clears throat> it's not like the technology does not exist or is not known. The question is, how do you develop business models uh, that can work? And so there, I don't think IMF and World Bank are, are, uh, are actually particularly um, um, efficient in, in, those, in those domains. I think that um, sort of local um, organizations, and we've seen quite a few of those developing really business logistical models that can overcome the challenges of bringing even simple technologies into the farmer's hands and increasing their livelihood by uh, 30, 40, 50, 100 percent a year, it's not a, such a big deal when you're increasing it from $300 to $600 in terms of, you know, sort of the developed world uh, uh, measures. But for them, it's a it's huge increase and it can be increased further. So I think that technology, business models, and the, what, I, what I described before, the disconnect between the large amounts of money that allegedly are willing to be invested, not not spent. Here I agree with Jason completely that for the next couple of years, I doubt that taxpayers in any country will look favorably on helping others when they are suffering. So in the in developed world. So um, I think that thinking about how to develop the deal flow of in, introducing technologies into the bottom of the pyramid and uh, making it work is, is, the, is the key uh, way to really help long-term um, these countries. And then the big institutions like World Bank and I, well, mostly World Bank and IFC, can actually step in and do scale up and facilitation, et cetera. But, but that, that, that part, by the way, according to IFC is missing. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Eugene. I'm now turning it over uh, to David who will uh, introduce the minister. Uh, thank you, Wendy. We're delighted to be joined by the Honorable Bruno Le Maire, the Minister of Economy and Finance of France. Minister Le Maire, we appreciate very much your long partnership and friendship with Elnet, and thank you for joining us today. The floor is yours for a short statement. 
Thank you, dear President, dear David, dear professors, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I would like just to start with uh, a few figures to explain uh, in which world we are now. In 2009, which was the most uh, important crisis uh, after the World War II in Europe, the Eurozone's GDP contracted by 4.5%. In 2020, according to uh, the last uh, assessment of the European Commission, the GDP is expected to contract by 7.7%. And in France, the uh, very last forecast is uh, a decrease by 11%. Not since World War II have we gone through such a deep recession. And I think that we should be all aware of uh, the dramatic and negative impact of the crisis on our all daily current life. But I would like uh, rather to focus on the action that we can take to help the global economy recover and recover fast. And, and I would like to seize this opportunity to uh, thank all uh, the professors that uh, are giving us some very key uh, advices I'm uh, thinking of uh, Professor Blanchard, for instance. We uh, have had interesting talks with the French president about the best way of responding to the crisis. But this is time where we need debates, exchanges of views, and uh, the support of um, professors in uh, economy. As far as the first response is concerned, I think that we have set up extremely quickly in France and in many other developed countries, emergency measures to absorb the economic shock on an unprecedented scale. And of course, we are increasing the level of public debt, but uh, as uh, Professor Blanchard explained, he proves to be right. Public debt now is not the key difficulty. The key issue is to support our economy and to avoid important failures in the economies of the developed countries. In 2009, I think that we acted too late and too timidly. And I really think that we have been able this time to draw the consequences of uh, this lack in 2009 by responding massively and quickly in 2020. European countries in just a few days have all developed a similar approach to protect businesses, to protect employees, and to protect skills. And if we have so far avoided a social and political crisis, I think that it is due to uh, the force and the efficiency of the first response that we have all together given to the crisis. Partial unemployment measures, for instance, have been set up everywhere. State guaranteed loans have been granted and support for the most fragile businesses has been provided. We are now entering a second phase, which is clearly the most difficult because it is the phase after the lockdown and uh, you have some economic sectors that have been severely hit by the crisis that are facing new and key challenges. And this new phase requires a second response, a different one. We are gradually reopening our economies. We now need to help companies through the hurdles of resuming the activity in safe conditions. We need to design appropriate recovery plans for sectors that have been fiercely affected. And that's exactly what we are doing now with the French president. We are defining and deciding very strong plans to support the tourism and catering sector, the automotive sector, the aeronautics, and the construction sectors. And I will present a new law to fund these sectoral plans next week at the French Council of Ministers for the sake of having all the plans being adopted by the end of July. Then we come the third and last step, which is still ahead of us. We will have to set 
in due time ambitious measures to boost our economic recovery and gear it towards the long run transformation of our economic model. I believe that we should wait until the end of summer to announce economic recovery plans because we need debates, we need a clear assessment of the best and most efficient measures, we need uh, the advice of uh, economics, politicians, and uh, CEOs to be sure that we are really taking the right long-term measures. Debates around the world are focusing on what recovery plans should aspire to for the day after. Should we build a brand new world? Should we stop globalization? Should we forego growth to stop climate change? Should we backtrack to the economy of the 19th century? I clearly do not believe in a brand new world where we wish there had been no globalization at all. What I do believe is that we need globalization to cure people, to grow, to innovate, and to fight against climate change and for the environment and as a global common good. However, I also believe that we need to make major changes in globalization as we know it. And I believe these changes should be guided by three simple words. Solidarity, sovereignty, and green recovery. The first pillar should be, to me, solidarity. Solidarity because this crisis will increase inequalities. And the uh, IMF has been uh, one of uh, the most uh, prominent figure explaining that we should care about the growing inequalities around the world because it's a risk of global political destabilization in developed countries, but also all over the world. Economic crisis hit the most vulnerable people. I'm thinking of young people, low-skilled workers, and older workers. People who are, the, who are the hardest hit by the crisis will need support. We cannot afford a wave of unemployment among young people. We cannot afford wasting a generation. This would be unbearable and also detrimental for our economies. When I'm speaking about solidarity, I'm also thinking about the necessity of having more solidarity among EU member states. And I'm really very proud of the decisions that have been taken by the Commission and the very last proposal put on the table by the Commission, 1,300 billion euros for the recovery plan of the EU Commission based on grants and loans. I think this is the right response at the right time. And I'm also very proud, to be very frank with you, that this plan has been inspired directly by the proposal put forward by Emmanuel Macron and Angela Merkel. But this is also a clear evidence of the willingness of the EU to build this new globalization on the principle of solidarity and not on the principle of selfishness. I would like also to insist on one single point on this economic recovery plan at the EU level based on solidarity, which is the fact that we are raising common debt. For the first time in the EU history, we will raise common debt to finance public uh, expenses. That's good news for the countries, that's good news for the EU member states, and that's good news for the European construction. When I'm speaking of solidarity, there is a last point I wanted to tackle, which is the question of international taxation. You know how much I've been involved in the necessity of redefining the international taxation for the 21st century. And I'm deeply convinced that solidarity means also a fairer taxation system at the international level. We are all aware that the winners of this crisis will be the digital giants. Nobody could understand that the winners of the crisis, digital giants, could avoid a fair 
taxation in the countries in which they are making profit. That's why we are so much insisting on the necessity of having a digital taxation adopted at the OECD level by the end of 2020. Solidarity in the taxation system means also a minimum taxation for the corporate tax. I think that a compromise uh, is, can be reached by the end of this year, and we should really not spare our efforts to reach that consensus on both digital taxation and minimum taxation by the end of this year, just to have the evidence that solidarity is also at the core of our new international taxation system. The second pillar is sovereignty. Sovereignty because this crisis has shown that the dependence of some countries on one or a few suppliers for strategic products can create unacceptable fragilities for our economies, unacceptable fragilities for our public opinion. That's why we are in the process in France and within European countries to identify strategic activities and joining forces between European partners, step up our investments so that we can produce critical services and goods in Europe. We have been successful in doing so with batteries for the car industry. There are many other areas where we should build similar industrial initiatives in tomorrow's technologies, starting with renewable energy, hydrogen, or artificial intelligence. The last pillar of this new globalization that we are advocating for is green recovery. The crisis must not be a pretext to postpone once again or environmental commitments. This would be an unforgivable political mistake. We made this mistake in 2009 when we relaunched our economy by investing in fossil technologies and brown industries. Let us not repeat history. Let us not do the same mistake in 2020. Our recovery must be a green recovery. We need to invest in renewable technologies. We need to make industrial production cleaner. We need innovation. And we need an effective carbon pricing system. And my deep conviction is that if we want to stick to the path of competitiveness, which has been at the core of the French policy since uh, 2017, we have to mix competitiveness and the fight against climate change. And the fact that we are putting so much money in innovation, in renewable technologies, will allow us to uh, remain in the race of competitiveness. I clearly think that the fight against climate change is a booster for the competitiveness of the French and the European economy. But it means also that we will have to introduce a carbon adjustment mechanism at the border of the EU, because our efforts to make our production cleaner would be wasted if they just lead to more imports that do not respect our high environmental standards. Solidarity, sovereignty, green recovery, these are the three principles we are proposing if we want the economic recovery to be a success. And I deeply believe that it can be and that it will be a success. We have already taken once in a lifetime measures. We have reached a historic European agreement to raise common debt to finance the economic recovery. So let's be confident in the future. I know how hard these times are for all of us, but let's be confident in the future. We have the determination it needs, and I believe we are moving in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, uh, Minister Le Maire. Uh, this was, that was a very important message at a critical time. And we at Elned and Startup Nation Central are grateful for your friendship. Uh, Wendy, back to you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Minister. There's no question that today's conversation took place at a critical moment, and it was a real opportunity
to bring together the finest minds to have a policy discussion on what's coming next and what can be done about it. Um, I now would like to um, bring us forward uh, to the, to the uh, follow-on event that we talked about earlier and share with you the poll results, which are just in. So according to all of you that filled in the poll, here are the two most uh, compelling sectors that you would like to see covered at, the, um, at our next online uh, conference. The first is Industry 4.0, Digitizing and Optimizing Operations. And the second is COVID-19 uh, Diagnostics and Decision Support. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, while today was a policy conversation, the follow-on uh, summit is going to be more focused on bringing specific technologies that can be applied to your countries and your companies with uh, the COVID-related uh, challenges. Now for the journalists, I see as we're watching the chat here in our control room that the questions just keep coming in. And uh, we weren't able to answer all of them, but Julia Le uh, Lisheka is uh, the host on chat. And she's actually available for the journalists that would still like to, uh, to submit any questions um, on the chat. So with that, stay well, and we look forward to seeing you at our next event. And over to you, David, for the close. Thank you, Wendy. We want to thank uh, our esteemed speakers for sharing their expertise and time with us today. Thank you to everyone who participated from uh, 28 countries uh, and to our partners at Startup Nation Central. LNET conducts briefings on global issues on a regular basis, and we look forward uh, to having you join us in the future. Thank you again, and everyone stay safe. This ends our session.